Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here today to talk with you about the multidisciplinary treatment of bone metastases from neuroendocrine tumors. In this session, I'll give you a brief introduction about bone metastases, talk a bit about how we evaluate these tumors in the bone, and share information about the multidisciplinary treatment of these tumors, focusing on surgery. About 15% of patients with neuroendocrine tumors will develop bone metastases during the course of their disease. These tumors are important for us to treat because they can be a source of significant pain for patients and may be a cause for worsening function and disability. When we consider treatment options for these tumors, we have a couple of goals in mind. We focus on improving pain that's been caused by bone tumors, work to maintain or improve function, and finally, try to provide some treatment for the local tumor in the bone. We're now going to talk about how these tumors are discovered, the radiology tests that we use to see them clearly, and then we'll dive into some of the treatments for them. Often, a patient will describe significant pain in a bone or joint. They'll describe the pain as being a deep ache. Occasionally, it wakes them at night or gets so bad that they have to use a cane or a walker. Sometimes, we unfortunately discover these tumors because the bone is broken through an abnormal area. Other times, we see them as an additional finding from an x-ray or scan that was done for another reason. The questions I ask my patients when I'm trying to understand the impact of a bone tumor focus on getting a sense of how bad the pain is, what the pain feels like, and how long it's been there, and how it's affecting my patient. It's also very important for me and my team to understand what cancer treatments my patient has been on as well. I then examine the area of pain where we know there is a bone tumor. If they haven't been done yet, radiology tests are then ordered to help us see exactly where the metastatic bone tumor is and get a better understanding of what anatomic structures are being affected. There are a variety of tests that can be performed, all of which show us different things. As an orthopedic surgeon, I love x-rays. They are a very simple, quick test that can be done during an office visit. They provide me with a lot of information about the size, location, and impact of that tumor on the bone. Here you can see the yellow arrow pointing to an area of a bone that appears darker than the bone above or below that spot. It has this appearance because there's a tumor in the bone that's begun to destroy and weaken it, causing this patient to have shoulder and arm pain. An MRI can be a very helpful radiology test to help us look at very fine anatomic detail of the bone and surrounding structures. Here is an MRI of a patient with neck pain along with arm pain and weakness. This MRI of the spine helps us to see not only the bone tumor, but also how it's pressing on the spinal cord. When we think about using CT scans to help with the evaluation of bone tumors, it's often best to think of them as a very fancy version of an X-ray. They are excellent tests to help me look at bones. In particular, they're very good for bones that have a somewhat more complicated shape than the mostly straight bones of our arms and legs. For example, here on this x-ray of a pelvis, you can see an arrow pointing to a very subtle dark spot. Because the pelvis is a bone-shaped bowl and holds some of the abdominal organs, it's sometimes difficult to clearly see bone tumors with a plain x-ray. This is a CT scan image of the patient whose x-ray you saw just a minute ago. We can now see that there are even more spots in the bone from this patient's metastatic bone tumor that we weren't able to see with x-ray alone. Bone scans are occasionally performed to help us get a look at the entire skeleton to help identify whether there is just one metastatic bone tumor or several. Now let's dive in and talk about some of the treatment options for metastatic bone tumors. In general, they fall into two categories, surgery and other treatments. As an orthopedic oncologist, my main role in taking care of patients with neuroendocrine tumors is to help treat or prevent broken bones from metastatic tumors with surgery. The type of surgery that we use for these tumors depends a lot on which bone or which part of the skeleton is involved. We use surgery in two situations, treating a bone that has broken because of a metastatic tumor or to prevent a bone with a tumor from breaking. While it's not always possible, our preference is to try to treat bones with metastatic tumors before they break. 
Regardless of when we perform surgery, I have two main goals. I want to offer the patient a surgery that allows them the quickest recovery possible with the fewest risks, and one that allows them to return to activities as quickly and with as few restrictions as possible. As I mentioned, it's my preference to try to prevent a bone from breaking, if at all possible. There are multiple pieces of information that I am able to use to help predict whether or not a bone is at risk for breaking, including the size and location of the tumor, along with how much pain a patient is experiencing. As part of a multidisciplinary treatment team of taking care of patients with metastatic bone tumors, I use information about the risk of a bone breaking, along with information from the patient's entire care team to determine the right time for surgery if it's necessary. I want to share with you some examples of the surgeries that can be done for tumors in different bones of the skeleton. This is an x-ray of a patient who had a large tumor in the upper part of the arm bone affecting the shoulder. You can actually see if you look very closely that the arm is broken. In this situation, the best treatment for this patient was to have the tumor and part of the arm bone removed and replaced with a partial shoulder replacement. This is a patient with a metastatic bone tumor in the spine. One of the challenges here was that the tumor was pressing on the spinal cord, causing pain and weakness. Surgery was performed to remove the tumor. A metal cage was inserted to replace the bone and screws and rods placed in the spine to stabilize it. The patient had a very good outcome with significant improvement in their pain and strength. The hip and thigh are very common locations for us to see metastatic bone tumors. In this case, the patient had a tumor that was destroying the bone on the lower side of the hip bone. Here, the bone had not yet completely broken, and we were able to place this rod and screw to help prevent it from breaking completely. Occasionally, tumors around the hip are treated with complex hip replacements that you can see here on the right side of the screen. Other treatments that can be given for metastatic bone tumors include a variety of medicines, such as pain medications or bone strengthening medicines. Less invasive treatments that are performed by our interventional radiology colleagues can also be used. And in many situations, radiation therapy is given to help with pain and treat metastatic bone tumors. Dr. Petroda is going to talk about that in more detail very shortly. In conclusion, the treatment of metastatic bone tumors is always best when we use a team or multidisciplinary approach. With the input of a patient's oncologist, their radiation oncologist, and their orthopedic surgeon, we work together to help improve pain and function for our patients with metastatic bone disease. Thank you. And now, Dr. Petroda. Thank you, Dr. Balak, for the introduction on this presentation, um, including the workup of bone metastases and the surgical management. I'd like to build off of that discussion with information on the role of radiation therapy in the multidisciplinary care of patients who suffer from bone metastases. I have no conflicts to disclose. Over the next several slides, I'd like to discuss four specific elements that pertain directly to the treatment of bone metastases using radiation therapy. First, to reiterate the goals of treatment for bone metastases. Secondly, to discuss the roles of radiation therapy in the treatment of bone metastases. Third, to discuss the available radiation treatment options. And finally, to end with looking ahead to future options for our patients who suffer from bone metastases. First and foremost, to reiterate the goals that Dr. Balak clearly outlined, the goals of radiation and any treatment for bone metastases include, one, pain reduction, two, the preservation of function of the bone, three, maintaining the integrity of the bone itself, four, and importantly, to stop the growth of the tumor, five, to potentially delay the need for systemic therapy for the cancer, and six, potentially to prolong survival in the context of the metastatic cancer. And over the next few slides, we're gonna go into some more detail about what is radiation therapy and how does it work? So what is radiation therapy? Generally, radiation therapy is the delivery of high energy x-rays directed at a tumor location. 
it's generally thought that radiation therapy kills a cancer by causing irreparable damage to the DNA of the cancer. In fact, more than 50% of cancer patients receive radiation therapy at some point during their treatment course. Radiation can be delivered both as a curative treatment option and palliative in certain situations. And in certain situations, radiation can be used after surgery or instead of surgery. And sometimes radiation is combined with chemotherapy or other systemic agents to synergize with the radiation to make it more impactful. Here is an example of a patient who unfortunately experienced a bone metastasis in the left femur. And as a result, the left femur needed to be operated on by our colleagues in orthopedic surgery. And after surgery, the patient required radiation therapy to a large area involving the left femur to minimize the risk for the tumor recurring and causing additional symptoms. So how do we do radiation? Well, first and foremost, every radiation plan is personalized to the patient. No radiation plan could be used on more than one patient because it's very precisely tailored to the patient, him or herself. We start with a radiation mapping session, and this is where we create a body mold that holds the patient in place, and we do a scan of the affected area. Once we do the scan, we take into account information from other diagnostic tests, such as an MRI, PET scan, or even bone scans. Putting all that information together, we accurately delineate where the tumor is located and appropriately design a radiation plan. The planning can be as fast as several hours and sometimes requires several days, depending on the complexity of the plan. Radiation is often delivered in between one to 10 treatments for bone metastases. And typically we use x-rays or CT scans at the time of treatment to make sure that we're precisely aligned to the tumor area so we can exactly address the tumor, but minimize the dose going to other areas of the body. One of the most important parts of radiation is picking the right dose. As you can see on this graph, on the vertical axis, we have the, the ability to control or kill the tumor, ranging from zero to 100%. On the horizontal axis, we've got the radiation dose, ranging from a low dose on the left side to a high dose on the right side. And depending on the type of tumor, we know that the, the dose delivered to the tumor directly impacts the ability to control the tumor, where a high dose would be more likely to kill the tumor and control it, where a low dose may be less likely, but may still improve pain. So we generally think of a low dose as being palliative or low enough to not cause a lot of symptoms, but enough to improve pain, whereas a high dose would be more likely to control the tumor long-term. How do we pick the right dose for a given patient? Here are some examples of a palliative low dose approach on the left versus a ablative or high dose approach on the right. And this is a patient that had a painful bone metastasis in the lower part of the spine. And what you can see is by contrast to the, the low dose palliative treatment on the left, the right side, the ablative high dose is a more complex plan and treats a more limited area compared to the palliative regimen, which is covering a broader area. And there are pros and cons to each of these approaches. And on the next slide, I'll go through a comparison of the palliative low dose regimens versus the higher dose ablative regimens and how we select the most appropriate treatment option for a given patient. So in comparison, the palliative doses are easy to plan. They're very fast and very quick to generate a treatment plan rapidly. By contrast, the ablative or high doses are slower to plan and more complex. In terms of targeting the tumor, typically palliative doses are less precise. They can cover a broader area, which may have benefits in certain situations, whereas the ablative or high doses are highly precise and best suited for smaller tumors. When a patient actually needs to be treated, the treatment delivery is vastly different between the two. For the palliative doses, it's pretty quick, about 10 or 20 minutes for a given treatment. Whereas for a higher dose, because there's more complexity involved, it can take between 30 to 45 minutes to deliver a, a given treatment. Pain responses seem to be 
quite good in both situations with 60 to 80 percent of patients receiving a pain benefit and the, the lower dose arm. But the palliative doses can often take a bit more time to experience a pain relief. By contrast, with the higher doses, the pain response tends to be a bit better and it tends to be more durable. However, the, the downside is that sometimes the pain can get a little worse before it gets better. That being said, both regimens are well tolerated, but the ability to control the tumor long term appears to be more durable with a higher dose. And there may be a benefit in terms of improving survival with the higher dose than the lower doses, but taken together, we have to think about all of the different factors that need to be considered when choosing the right radiation regimen. So how do we pick the best dose for a given patient? How do we personalize a treatment? Well, we think about the type of cancer. Is it resistant or sensitive to radiation? How long do we expect that we would need to be controlling the tumor? What's the life expectancy of a given patient? Importantly, how tolerable is the treatment itself for the patient? Can a patient lay flat for upwards of 10, 20 minutes if needed? Also, what are all the available treatment options, both localized and systemic? Importantly, how urgent is the treatment needed? Is the pain so unbearable that we need to get treated right away? Or do we have a bit more time to come up with a more complex plan? Also, what's the health of the bone? Is it at risk for fracture or is it healthy? And is the tumor taking up a very small part of the bone? In addition, is the lesion located next to another area of the body that is very sensitive to treatment that we need to be very mindful of and protect with all our efforts? And finally, has the area been previously radiated? That definitely is an important factor that we need to account for when designing any radiation plan. Looking ahead, it's always important to note that a team approach is always going to win. And we have a fantastic team of orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, interventional radiologists, anesthesiologists, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists who put their heads together to come up with the best personalized plan for each patient. We personalize it from the perspective of local treatment options as well as systemic options. And finally, what we're seeing today is that there are a number of advances in the field of, of oncology. And so with that, I thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and about this topic that we're very passionate about. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.